and thank you for joining us. And welcome to Heritage Mississauga's new webinar series, Black Heritage Matters, as we connect with Black History Month. This program will be available on our YouTube and our Heritage Bites podcast channels. Through this educational webinar series, we are bringing you speakers who have lived experience and expertise to explore the history and share the stories of Black Canadians. Heritage Mississauga gratefully acknowledges the Hazel Battalion Fund for Arts, Culture and Heritage at the Community Foundation of Mississauga, a registered charitable public foundation serving the people of Mississauga, and also to the City of Mississauga Culture Division for their financial support to host this webinar series during Black History Month. To kick off Heritage Mississauga's Black Heritage Matters webinar series, it is my pleasure to welcome our guest speaker today, Leslie Harper. Leslie is the owner of Niagara Bound Tours, a tour company that specializes in Black history tours since 2004. As well as doing tours in, in Niagara, Leslie also organizes tours to other destinations as well. Leslie is a descendant of freedom seekers who came to the Fort Erie area in 1851 and has documented many stories connecting to the Underground Railroad. As well as running her own tours, she also sits on various boards and committees promoting Black history. At the present time, she is on the Underground Railroad Consortium of New York State, the Ontario Black History Society, the International Harriet Tubman Trail Committee, and the John Brown Lives Festival Committee. To balance things out, she's also the Vice President of the Riverbrink Art Museum Board. You can visit her at her website at Niagara Bound Tours, niagarabandtours.com, and on her Facebook page. Welcome, Leslie, and thank you so very much for your willingness to take part in this series. Thank you very much, Matthew. I'm so excited to be here today whenever I have an opportunity to share Black history. I'm always delighted. Um, I'm a little, I had such a wait time there that my anxiety is a little higher than it usually is, believe it or not, I do get anxiety. And um, so I do a bit, of, some would call it a prayer, I call it an affirmation. So before I start, if you'll just indulge me a moment, it takes away my anxiety. And it's this, dear Lord in heaven, thank you so much for an opportunity to once again share this history. I ask you now to use my voice to speak the words these people need to hear, amen. So what that does, it alleviates my anxiety. And also, as I tell people on my tours, and I'll tell you this afternoon, if you don't like what I'm saying, you can't blame me, you have to blame God. So it makes me feel better and I just, it just helps. I'm very proud to be a Canadian. And I'm gonna share my screen, but in the background, I should tell you, and we'll talk about it in a moment. It's called, this is why black history is important. It's a crossing point for so many things, psychologically, physically, emotionally, geographically, and so on. And so this site is very important and I'll talk about it shortly. I'm gonna bring up my screen now. All right, first of all, I start this with my family. These are my ancestors. And what I like to tell people right off the get-go, these are Canadians. So often we don't think about people that look like my ancestors as being Canadian. We're not from the island. I must admit when I worked in the wine industry though, People would, um, on my tours, would ask me when I worked up taking people down to wine tours, they would ask me, oh, so what island are you from? And I used to say the Niagara Peninsula cut off by the Welling Canal, just to keep that straight. The people that you're looking in this picture are part of the slavery um, industry, if you will, that existed throughout North America and throughout the world, actually. I try to explain to people that Slavery was like oil and gas is today. It was a commodity. It wasn't, um, it, it, it was everywhere. Africans participated in it. If an African tribe was fighting with another African tribe and that tribe and the losing tribe was sold into slavery. Some blacks have said, oh, it wasn't as cruel the slavery that um, they sold into. They didn't know it was gonna be as cruel. They did know because they also have certain apparatuses that they used to condition human beings to be subservient and become enslaved people. The people you see in this picture all have that DNA in their blood. This picture of my ancestors and family, not all of them are family, they're attending a family wedding of my uncle Roy and Alice Bright. Um, the little girl at the top of the photograph is my mother. She was probably around two years old at the time. Um, a little bit on, well, yeah, maybe about two years old at the time the picture was taken. 
but when you look at them, they they maintained their faith. They had jobs. They had their homes. My family, um, a lot of people are shocked and surprised that many of the older multi-generational Blacks in Canada, like myself, um, and people can't believe it, but we were conservative politically because you have to understand when you've been enslaved by white people, you come to a country where it's run by white people, you're not as you're not that comfortable giving your freedom over to white folks. So you maintain your own life in your own world. But what's amazing, what was wonderful for blacks that were interested, um, you could become a politician here in Canada. You could never do that in the US, but you were allowed that freedom. It wasn't all nirvana here, and I won't mislead people into that, but we were, um, we did have more freedoms that they were not able, Blacks were not able to enjoy in the US. Um, I'm gonna talk about the history. Now there's so much, and I'm looking forward to questions. I want to make sure that you understand, please ask me anything, and I mean anything you want. It always makes me sad when people say, this might be a stupid question, but I want those questions. I want people to feel comfortable asking me questions. The only way that we're going to deal with the issues of today is by asking questions. And it's really important that you know that um, I'm not politically correct. Very, I'm not very good at being politically correct. Um, I, when I first was heard the term that I was racialized, I was very angry because I'm not a one dimensional person. There's times in my life I forget I'm a color. So to tell me I'm racialized, it always seems to imply victimization. And I'm not, I didn't have a good time. I didn't have a lot of self-esteem, but I'm where I am now. And that's a good thing. So I want you to feel comfortable asking me questions. And it's important you know a little bit about whom I am so that you are comfortable asking those questions. Um, the first, the first site there, the first site, is my favorite. And I also have it in the background on my um, picture here, my, with my profile. And I call it the crossing point. That's Fort Erie, Ontario. That's the Niagara River. And that's Buffalo, New York, known as Black Rock. Black Rock um, was, is Buffalo now, but at the time, um, it was a very popular point where ferry boats would land. And also ferry boats would land on this side of the water as well. Because we didn't have had the Peace Bridge built until 1927, many a freedom seeker would come through on the ferry boats because that was the only way to get across. Um, they would cross at various points, the Detroit River, Windsor, Detroit, um, in Niagara Falls, suspension bridge if they could take the train as Harriet Tubman did. And um, there's a signage down there that points that out, but many of them would cross by boats actually near the falls in Niagara Falls. Um, so many, Lewiston was another one into Queenston. So there were many spots along the Niagara River where people would cross and Lake Erie. They would cross from Lake Erie from the Ohio area. Um, my family was from Kentucky. So I'm not sure exactly how they entered Canada. Sadly, when um, I became, I knew about the Underground Railroad from the time I was an infant, I feel. I, I always knew that term. And when I became old enough, I asked my family, were we part of the Underground Railroad? And the response of my family, sadly, but I get it in a way, was never mind that you're here now. And that could have been because the Underground Railroad was a secret, so they didn't want to share that secret. Or number two, it was too painful. In the 1970s, um, the Niagara region discovered Black history, which was like, duh, we've been here for a long time. But um, they started to acknowledge it publicly, if you will. And my great uncle Kit, my grandmother's brother, I went back to him and asked him. So a lot of the stories I share was be, were because he was able to tell me some things. And in the 70s, I tried to approach various entities without, throughout the region to share what I knew and to see if they'd be interested in asking my uncle Kit and some of my other, of my grandmother's siblings questions. And they weren't interested at the time because it was oral history. And um, so I did the best I could, never realizing that eventually I'd be sharing this history with the world. I thought, fine, I'll write a book and then it won't be oral anymore. And it turned out that I do these tours and I still would love to write the book. 
um, but it, that requires other things that I just am, I just don't have at the moment. So the tour and the online presentations, I'm truly blessed so that I can tell you about. The story my uncle Kit shared with me about my family is there were two brothers and a nine-year-old sister that came in from Kentucky. The story, the part of their journey that he told me was that at one point in time, the three of them had fallen asleep, but something woke the boys up and they took off like a shot. They got a quarter of a mile away when they realized they had left their baby sister sleeping in a log. I wish I had known that story when I was younger because the pride that I have because of what those brave young men did is overwhelming. They went back and they got that baby sister and the three of them arrived in Canada in 1851. To go back at their own peril. We don't know if it was, he did, my uncle didn't tell me, we didn't know if it was hound dogs or bounty hunters or, or whatever it could be. But to go back and get that baby sister says so much about the character and the DNA that I have in my blood. It was, I'm very proud of them. So they lived in Fort Erie and um, there's a lot of, there was some myths that have been out there in Fort Erie. Some of you may have even been to the doll house that they had in Fort Erie that was labeled a safe house at one point in time. It took 10 years, but um, uh, they finally have taken the signage down. It never was a safe house. It wouldn't even, if people applied critical thinking to some of this black history, a lot of these myths um, would never have occurred. Um, the reason that that could never have been a safe house, first they were looking for Underground Railroad, and I was um, remiss, I should tell you, Underground Railroad was not a series of tunnels. It was a system, an Underground Railroad quiet system of moving in slave, from slavery to freedom. It was made of blacks, whites, and reds, not all reds. In South Carolina, I've read in South Carolina, they'd shoot at the freedom seekers. In Canada, we were blessed, they would help. They would help them get settled along the river and share what they had. Joseph Brandt, although at one point in time owned enslaved people, he also at one point, but then when my family arrived, these new black refugees were invited to marry within the Six Nations. And that's exactly what my ancestor did. I'm part Mohawk as well. It wasn't easy. And the other thing about the safe house that they had suggested was down about a mile away. Now I mentioned earlier that if you were white, if you were black, you wouldn't feel you'd want to go to a white person's house that would you'd be afraid of becoming enslaved or was a trick who knows when right across the street was a black settlement not too right right across the street there was a whole settlement of black people who lived in the area during that time period. Here's a picture of all the ferry landings that existed. Um, a man by the name of Foresight owned actually two of them. You'll see labeled there. And Foresight is the one, the second Foresight down uh, landing is the one that we're looking at. And he also owned the house that was labeled a safe house. His, and Birdie Foresight was the family name as well. And you'll see the name Birdie Street there. So up in that area where it says Birdie Street, Catherine Street, that was a black settlement of about 200 blacks. And um, I'll talk about that a little bit more. I don't want, I want to get in as much as I can. If you look across um, the water, you'll see an iron bridge. That iron bridge was part of the old Erie Canal, which was very popular coming up from the Hudson Valley, Albany, New York State, and brought, you could ride all the way up. And there were captains of ferry boats that would help out freedom seekers, give them free passage and hide them on the boats. And also many of the enslaved worked on the boats. And um, in New York State, they abolished slavery in 1827. So you have free men working on the boats that would help shelter freedom seekers who were making their way from the south to the north via the boats that would come through the Erie Canal. So there was a ferry crossing located at that bridge. And now this picture was taken a long time ago. Is that is an actual underground railroad site. So if you're ever in Buffalo, it's Broderick Park. And it's an interesting site. They have both the Canadian and US flags. On this side of the border, we have a much more modest um, symbol, which I enjoy, but there's some new stuff hopefully coming down the pipe that I hope will happen on this site. And it's a simple rock with a plaque on it. That's who the people were that came here. Very simple people who wanted to and I know this word is taken out of context sometimes now, but assimilate, 
as did many of the new, new Canadians, whether they be from Germany or Ireland or England or what have you, just wanted to assimilate into this new Canada, into this new country called Canada, which at the time my family came was, this was basically still Upper Canada. One of the most famous people to have crossed into this area was a man, as you'll see on the plaque, by the name of Josiah Henson. Josiah Henson was born in the western shores of Maryland, in the Rockville area, if you're used to, if you know Maryland at all. And he was the character used in Harriet Beecher Stowe's book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Harriet Beecher Stowe had witnessed a slave market and was quite, the slave market became very real to her when she saw that. And so she wrote a book about it. It's a rather rudimentary book. Um, I, met, I read it when I was much younger. And um, it was interesting to me as a younger person, but it had a huge impact on me as an adult. There's a young girl in it named Topsy. And when I read it about Topsy, I thought, oh, first time I thought foolish black girl, but, um, and, and she made me uncomfortable. It's like, that's what people, that's what people think of us. So she's just a stereotype of what people think of us. But when I read it as an adult, my sensitivity and my knowledge had heightened. I actually cried about, about Topsy because Topsy was the product of, slave, of the slave industry. She had been born of a woman who had been used as a concubine to produce enslaved individuals. And Topsy was a result of that. She did not know or appreciate the fact she could have even had a mother or a father in her life. And that made me sad. Um, I highly suggest if you want to read something, you read Uncle Tom's narrative along with the Harriet Beecher Stowe book. It's a good place to start. And there's many, many books out there, and I can always help people if they want to read further, because there's so much history in Niagara. Um, Josiah Henson's story, and I'll tell it as quickly as I can, because I'm probably already running out of time. Um, he was born on the Western Shores, as I mentioned. His father had been sort of the cheerleader of the, in Maryland, they call them farms. There's still plantations, but they call them farms. And um, he had been, his father had been the cheerleader of the farm and kept people's spirits up and just kept people going. Well, one day the overseer decided to hit on, and I use the word lightly, um, hit on Josiah's mother. And the overseer is the supervisor of the plantation. And Josiah's father did what any husband would do. He went to rescue his wife. And he beat up on the white overseer, which, as you can imagine, would not go over well. Josiah's father was beaten 50 times. And when they realized he wasn't dead yet, they brought out all the people on the farm to watch, including five-year-old Josiah. So they beat him 50 times when he wasn't dead. They beat him 50 times more. Can you imagine blood, open sores, just incredible. When he wasn't dead yet, they tied him to a tree and chopped off his ear. They definitely killed this man's spirit. He was never the same again and was eventually sold off to the plantation and Josiah never saw his father again. When I talk about people, particularly on my tour, I do visit this site as I do many sites in Niagara region. We always have to remember of the psychological, physical, emotional abuse and beatings that people took, including my family, I'm sure. Um, they don't always talk about it, but the scars were there and how they were able to rise above it is what inspires me and what in should inspire everyone. And the reason this history also is important is for new um, Canadians or people that want to be Canadians that come to this country that have never heard this story before and aren't sure where to go or where to turn or how to deal with things. They can learn from the people that I'm from and how we rose above. And I've spoken in schools from time to time and young children as young as 10 have shared their stories with me of their families from two places that I remember just off the top of my head, Nicaragua and Iran, and shared their stories of their family and their escape from those countries and how it worked for them. This is a universal story for everyone who's coming into Canada now or around the world, moving around from one place to another. Not that it makes it any easier, I'm sure it still makes it tough, but there's hope. It gives them hope and faith to carry on. At least I hope that's what it will do for people. In Josiah Henson's situation, he eventually became the overseer of the farm, which is amazing to think a black man was so trusted and so loyal, which Josiah Henson became, 
that the owner put him in charge of eight enslaved people to be moved from Maryland to Kentucky. Can you imagine? They didn't run away. Josiah Henson was offered freedom. Nope, he had been saving up his money to purchase his freedom. Many Blacks would work for other plantations to earn money on the Sundays when they would normally be off, off of the plantations or doing whatever kind of work they were doing. And uh, so Josiah was saving his money to purchase his freedom for himself and his family. And when he was offered freedom, he said, no, I said I was going to deliver these people. One of the things that's happening right now with um, the new information that's coming out about history, Dundas Street, for instance, um, they want to change all the streets in Toronto of Dundas. They need to stop for a second and think about that. Um, you have to put your mind back into those days. Uh, Dundas was a politician who was suggesting that they delay the abolition of slavery. I realize we're talking human beings, but he was suggesting they delay it because it was of the economics, a worldwide commodity like oil and gas. Oil and gas, fossil fuels are not good for the environment today, but we're not cutting it off right away because of the economy. We're, we're moving towards it. And that's what Dundas was suggesting. He also was involved in an anti-slavery um, environment event, if you will, in Scotland. So how much of a demon man was he really? We really need to do a deep dive and we must always remember to look at the, these things through the eyeballs of the time period because it's 2022 now, down the road. I wonder how the world's going to look at us historically when we still have human trafficking going on around the world. How could we have continued to let that happen? So we really need to look at these historic things, although still incredibly um, unjust and cruel at times, we need to look at them at the time that they happened and not with today's eyes and the evolution of our own supposed knowledge. So Josiah, finishing up on him, he actually, um, he delivered the enslaved to Kentucky, but eventually he heard that his enslaver may sell him. Now he had, had lost one family to slavery and he thought, I'm not gonna lose another. But over his lifetime, he had been physically injured as well with his shoulder blades broken. He couldn't lift his arms in the air. He could only move forward and put his arms out. He couldn't lift, but he had two children that were not gonna be able to walk from Maryland to Canada. It's a 10 hour car drive. And can you imagine, he came in October and at one time in my life, I was down in the Garrett Smith area of Peterborough, New York. And um, Garrett Smith was probably the largest funder of abolitionist and suffrage um, uh, funds in North America. Today's equivalent, he put out approximately, they said, $7 million. So many enslaved people would have traveled through this little hamlet of Peterborough that I was traveling through one night to attend a conference. And while I was driving through, it was a cold, rainy October night. And these roads are very, very dark. And I just started to think about the freedom seekers that would be traveling at night because that was our preferred time to travel. And um, it, was, it was just amazing to me to think he had to carry these two children and older people and, and not enough food and water. And we have a tendency to look at all this in a very benign manner. And if we do a little bit of a deeper dive with some critical thinking, I think all Blacks would feel much prouder of themselves and persevere, I believe, a little more like I've come to do, um, knowing where I come from and understanding my history here in Canada. I don't even have to go back into Africa because what we did here in Canada, in Ontario, in Niagara, is just amazing how we've survived. So Josiah decided that he practiced how he would, would carry those children. And when he arrived on this site in Fort Erie, he said he jumped around like a crazy man because he was free. He only stayed in Fort Erie for about a year and a half because he heard about Dawn Settlement being um, introduced in the Dresden area with the Quakers. And that's what he always wanted to do. And when I first started my tours, I thought, why didn't he just stay in Fort Erie? And uh, the reason he, he had a more eloquent way of putting it, but I put it this way. My family were not entrepreneurial. They weren't big on education, even though it wasn't offered to them. My great uncle Ken only went to grade six because that's all that was offered at the time in this area. And um, they were agricultural, they were labor-minded, always taking care of themselves, keeping faith, keeping their church. 
And oh, they build a church in this area as well, which we'll talk about in a minute. And uh, he became that kind of person. He helped build a grist mill in the area. He was the minister in the area. He fought in the rebellions of Upper Canada in 1837. And then he had an opportunity to go to London, England, where Queen Victoria had read the book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. It's recorded that she wept when she read the book. She didn't come to the throne until three years after emancipation after the Emancipation Proclamation that abolished um, this enslavement activity throughout the British Empire. So she wanted to meet him. And he had read about Queen Victoria and he couldn't believe that she was a white woman. Because remember, Blacks didn't think that there were white people that really cared about them at all, or that they, they were important, that they were human. That's how badly life was for Blacks in that were involved in enslavement around the world. This was the symbol that was used at the time um, back in the 70s to signify underground railroad sites, the running man. There's been some debate on whether to use that anymore or not, because if you were a running man, you wouldn't want to look like one. You wouldn't want to look like this guy. That's why disguises were made up. Um, groups were split up so that if they were looking for eight people, they might only find two, 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 and two, 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 two and two. Is that eight? Yeah, I think so. Anyway, they split the groups up. They would do whatever they had to do, um, disguises. There's a couple out of the states that um, the woman was quite light. She could pass for white and her husband was dark. So she dressed up as the mistress and her husband dressed up as her enslaved um, helper servant, if you will. They were able to stay in hotels, eat in the restaurants, and they traveled from slavery to freedom that way. Can you imagine? The, and there's so many ways that they tra were tra transported, not just with that wagon that you see, but many, and which was clever. The wagon was definitely clever, but there were other ways that they traveled to freedom as well. But there's a little bit of debate on whether we would use the running man if we were to revisit it. But this was what it was like back in the 70s and 80s, and it showed sites that we had in Niagara. Next is I'm going to talk about Lavinia Street. Um, this is the area I told you once they got off the ferry that was right at the bottom of Bertie and um, Bertie and Niagara Boulevard, and it started there and went up a hill. It was noted at the time there were 200 blacks that lived in that area, and at one point in time, it was, when I grew up, it was called Bertie Hill, but back in the day, it would have been called the N Hill. And on the in that area was a church called the British Methodist Episcopal Church. We have many, we had many of them scattered throughout Ontario. They were churches built by freedom seekers, originally African Methodist Episcopal. But in 1855, we changed the name to British Methodist Episcopal, acknowledging the British who had given us freedom. Although the Brits had been the ones that were the lar were a large um, transporter of enslaved, Brazil was actually the largest importer, importing about 5 million. But Britain was really big on the um, overall industry. The Portuguese and the Dutch actually started the enslaved movement and the Brits picked up the banner. But so to me, I always tell people, think about that for a minute. Blacks who were, had been enslaved chose the term British in the name of their church in Canada. The people who had enslaved them, but also gave them freedom was the name of the people that they chose to name their church after, which I think gives us pause. They must have forgiven them. So when people wanna knock colonialism, I think they might want to think about that a little bit further. I hope you're writing down lots of questions because I would love to answer lots of questions today, just as a reminder. Now, the name Lavinia comes by the from a name of a woman who lived in the area who was the chief trustee of the BME church in Fort Erie. Her name was Lavinia Taylor Chandler. She married a man by the name of William John Chandler. William John Chandler was from London, Ontario. And when um, Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. That meant that Blacks in the US, since formerly enslaved Blacks, could fight in the Civil War. It also allowed Blacks and whites from Canada to now go and fight on either the Confederate side or the Union side um, of the Civil War. And um, some, believe it or not, there were some Blacks that believed that the Confederate Army should win the Civil War, because remember, people were predisposed to believe after 200 years of enslavement that that's what they were born for, was to be enslaved. Blacks were born to be enslaved. White people were born to rule over them. They couldn't help it. It was somewhat like the Stockholm Syndrome, if you will. 
So they, um, so, but William John chose to fight on the Union side. He may have fought at Gettysburg, requires a little bit more research, but he certainly um, fought in Florida where his arm was sadly amputated, but he recovered from that and um, wouldn't have been an easy task wouldn't have been, would have seen the horrors of that incredible war. If you ever have a chance to go to Gettysburg, it really hits home to really appreciate what the Civil War was like in the US to visit the sites of Gettysburg, which I've done and I can highly recommend it. Anyway, um, he made, William made it back to Fort Erie, but he met the lovely Lavinia. They married and they lived on the street that eventually had her name. And um, she took in laundry for white families in the community, as well as running the church. And he was what they called a taxi driver, horse and buggy. And they lived out their lives on Lavinia Street. And I actually grew up on Lavinia Street. And it only occurred to me a few years ago, just something that's really unique um, in my life. And not many people can say that they grew up on the street that's named after their great grandmother. I've just told you the story of my great grandmother and my great grandfather. And I'm so proud of my great grandfather because he will now be featured in an exhibit that's opening up at the Canadian War Museum um, this month as a participant, as a, a Canadian military that fought in the Civil War. I also have another relative, John Bright, who fought in, in um, Passchendaele and also at the beginning of World War II, also worked at the Welland Canal to protect it. Must have been a special man because Canada wasn't all that um, I don't want to say interested, but they weren't all that willing to bring in that many blacks to fight in the war. So for my ancestor, John Bright, to be brought on to make sure that the Welling Canal was secure and then go on to Passchendaele. He did receive a silver medal, by the way, and is buried in France. He will also be a part of the Canadian War Museum exhibit that um, opens this month in Ottawa. The last site in Fort Erie that I share is a site that's called the Colored Cemetery. Uncle Kip called it that. And a lot of people see, when I take them out to this site, they go, oh, colored. No, no, you don't have to do that. We chose the name colored for ourselves. We're, we're not all black. We have white. I also, as well as my Mohawk roots, I also have German blood in me. And this is all just on my mother's side. I'm waiting for myancestry.com to see what's on the, my dad's side. And uh, that should be interesting. I've always called myself a mutt and I identify myself as a Canadian of African descent diluted because there's other pieces and parts to me. And when people are upset, how the name uh, black came about was when we had newer blacks come into North America, they thought that the term colored was something that the white man had given us. No, not at all. When we started our, when you think about it, our first, one of the first civil rights organizations um, that started in North America, we incorporated the word color into the title of what the organization would be called. And the organization NAACP, the organization um, that supported Martin Luther King and many others, the full name is the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. We wouldn't have used the term if we weren't comfortable with it. So that's what we call ourselves. But newer um, North American Blacks decided that we had to go with another name. I go by Black now, but I had someone on a tour once ask me, so Leslie, what do we call you? And I said, I don't know. They haven't told me yet. So I, 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 I preferred color at the time, for sure, because it was um, it was trying to fit into a white community and a white society was tough enough without having this in your face um, name for myself, black. It was like, oh my gosh. But I got used to it and it is what it is. But I'm a Canadian first, just like those people in the first picture, Canadians as well. That's another reason why this history is so important. One of the reasons, so I, when my Uncle Kit told my mother and I about this cemetery, I said, Uncle Kit, take us out and show us where it is. He was in his 80s, sound mind, sound body, pretty much sound body. And um, I had him get in the car and we, he directed me right to this cemetery. We were drawn to this particular stone because of its unusual shape. All of the other ones, as you can see, are flat. And this one was different. It's also the same design as the one for Josiah Henson. Now, earlier I talked to you about how I'm a descendant of these two, these three young people 
from Kentucky. The two brothers, Jack and Sylvester, and the nine-year-old sister. Well, it turns out we were drawn to this stone, believe it or not, because our, some of our ancestors are buried at this particular grave site and um, at the stone, and the name of it is Bright. We looked at the stone and it's um, children of Sylvester Bright, the one brother. I'm a descendant of Jack, the other Bright. But what was interesting was a bit of a twilight zone moment for us was when we looked at the name on the stones of those that were buried right there, an infant baby by the name of Essie is buried there. Now, my name is Leslie. My mother had no idea of this person, this, these people existing. And she called me Essie my entire life. And I asked her, where did it come from? She said, I don't know. It's just a name I gave you. So it was really Twilight Zone-ish to think that my mother had given me the nickname of an ancestor who's actually buried here at, the, um, at this cemetery site. So it was all overgrown, and people will um, have recorded it as a segregated cemetery. Not by, and it's, it gets understood that that's racially, no, it was because of religion. Around the corner is St. John's Anglican Church, built in 1840, and they were there to help Blacks, but Blacks also needed a place to be buried. And the Sisler family had cut out this piece of their property to, for people that lived in the community to bury their dead because unless you were Anglican, you couldn't be buried in the Anglican cemetery. There's also War of 1812 that's buried there. So that's another reason why it wasn't segregated. Um, we weren't asked to, to uh, participate in what Fort Erie decided to call the name of the cemetery. Um, I might've chosen another name, but Color Cemetery facilitates conversation. And you know, that's what I really like. We'll now move on to St. Catharines, and uh, this is the 200th anniversary of the birth of Harriet Tubman. There's going to be all kinds of activities happening in September. I'm hoping to run a tour from Maryland into Ontario so people can um, appreciate more, not just what Harriet Tubman went through, but many of Freedom Seeker went through. Um, I'm collaborating with, right now, the state of Maryland, soon to be to, um, Delaware, Philly, New York State. We hope to have an announcement in March announcing this tour, but so many things are happening all at the same time and I can't get into the states to do what I need to help make sure this all gets on a roll. So we'll see how it happens. For those of you that are praying folks, pray with me that it all gets settled down fairly soon. Getting back to um, the BME Church before I talk a little bit more about Harriet. The B this is the BME Church in St. Catherine. Some may be familiar on Geneva Street. Um, this is the one that's modeled after what they call Mother Bethel in Philadelphia, exact replica of the one that you would find in Philadelphia. Harriet Tubman would have attended this church when she was in the area. She would be in and out of the area um, quite frequently. She would have hunkered down when John Brown um, was charged with treason, the white man from the Midwest that hated slavery so much he was going to blow up a munitions place called Harper's Ferry in Virginia, but he was caught charged with treason and hung white man, but he hated slavery. Harriet Tubman, as well as Frederick Douglass and others um, were revered him to the point where Harriet Tubman in 1912 opened up a boarding house in his in John Brown's name at her home in Auburn, New York, but I'll talk a little bit more about that as we move forward. So the church right now isn't open. I'm not sure when it will be open, um, but it is an important year. It's one of the most iconic sites we have. I would suggest the most iconic site we have because it's still an active church. Um, I'm not sure whether it's open to the public for services right now or not, um, but it is. it has been open to groups and I take people whenever it is open. Right now, it, um, it's still closed. But when it's open, I'm happy to take people to visit. So this would, and the little beige building you see on the right-hand side, on the opposite side of that is where the boarding house where Harriet Tubman stayed when she was in the area would have existed. It was also told to me by a woman by the name of Marjorie Dawson, one of the, um, she's now passed away. She was the matriarch of the Black History community. She shared with me that Harriet Tubman also lived on Queenston Street in St. Catharines at one point in time. Sadly, um, 
that research hasn't been dug into any deeper, so I don't have any more information. But we do know she was in St. Catharines, as many of her documentations and stories are out there for all to read and learn about. This is one of my favorite pictures, and I love to talk about Harriet Tubman here. This is a mural of Harriet Tubman um, in Maryland. And you see the little girl with her hand out. Uh, I just love this picture with the Stewart Canal, which, by the way, enslaved people in um, in Cambridge, Eastern Shore, Dorchester County, dug by hand. This is what enslaved people had to do, dug a canal by hand. Think about that for five minutes and what it would be like. Water snakes, bugs, mosquitoes, hot days, murky water, all the horrible things, being whipped if you didn't behave yourself, all the things people went through. But this is where she was from. She always wanted freedom. At five years old, she um, was enslaved and shouldn't have been because they went by the mother's bloodline, whether you were enslaved or not enslaved. Her mother should have been left free um, according to the will of her enslaver. And at one point in time, Harriet Tubman even went to the courts to get that situation resolved, but it didn't happen. They didn't um, release her from her slave chains. At five years old, she was leased out to a mistress to sweep and dust. Can you imagine? Sweep and dust at five, but wasn't taught how. So she was repeatedly beaten at five by this mistress because she didn't know how to sweep and dust. The sister of the mistress took mercy on the little girl and told her how to sweep and dust. She was, Harriet Tubman was born Armamita Ross. They called her Minty. And at the age of 12, she was growing into a young lady and she had been out in the field she had been picking flax which is like a, a wheat and the dust was in her hair enslaved people did not eat with a fork and knife they ate with their hands and um they would clean their hair they would clean their hands off in their hair and she had an afro she didn't call it an afro when she described this but by the description present day terms it was an afro so she would clean her hands off in her hair the oil from the foods that she would eat were attached to her hair and the flax now was attached to her hair and the cook at the house said minty i need you to go to the store she said i can't go to the store look at me she said minty you're going to the store so of course minty had to go to the bucktown village store and while she was walking in there was an enslaved person running through the store who was being chased by the overseer the overseer said stop that slave and rather than do that, Minty moved out of the way. The overseer had picked up a weight the size of a fist and threw it at the enslaved, missed the enslaved, hit Harriet upside the head, Minty, upside the head, down she went. They put her on a two by four and took her to the farm where her mother was. Her mother tried to nurse her daughter back as best she could overnight, but Minty was back out in the fields and eventually with blood and sweat pouring off of her, she she passed out and had to go through a convalescence of two to three weeks. A lot of people read that when she would bring people out of enslavement, it would be, um, it would, it would be, um, she would go to sleep, excuse me. She would go to sleep like she had narcolepsy. She didn't have nar narcolepsy. She had what they called temporal ep epilepsy. So that's why she would wake up and know what was going on. People try to make her mystify her and say that she would wake up and know exactly what was going on around her. Well, yeah, she would because she had a seizure, excuse me. So she would be aware for those 20 or 30 minutes that she couldn't move or speak. Um, so the next part of her life was she suffered from headaches her entire life. She saw auras, auras, excuse me. And she had an enhanced faith in God and felt that God talked to her. And God was number one in her life. She used to care. She couldn't read or write. She carried around a hymnal that she couldn't read, but it was like a Bible to her. Uh, it would be her talisman, I assume you could say. But she carried it with her. It's at the museum in Washington, D.C. now. And um, faith was what drove her. And she actually um, knew information. She brought up between 60 and 70 and did 13 trips, not 19 trips. This is documented by Dr. Clay, Kate Clifford Larson's book. Bound for Canaan that she wrote in 2008 for her dissertation for her PhD. Wonderful, pivotal moment in Black history, because up until then, um, people took creative license with our history and just, oh, let's romanticize, mythologize it. And that's what would happen quite frequently. 
But in 2008, things started to change and we're still fighting some of those myths out there, but we're moving forward and that's what's always more important. So Harriet, uh, she married a man by the name of John Tubman who was a free man. And it would have been difficult for enslaved and free to marry in those days. They weren't allowed to live together. So their love must have been deep and strong. And um, she changed her name then. She took her mother's name. They called her mother Rit, but her mother's real name was Harriet. And she took John Tubman's last name, Tubman. And then she became Harriet Tubman. She came up to, but she wanted to be free. She approached John about being free and he was quite content being a free man in Maryland. Remember the time, we're talking the 1840s, not 2022. They had their painful goodbye, as many would have, never knowing if they'd see one another again, if they made it to the North, did they die, are they okay, what happened? They wouldn't have that information. That's why um, a more critical, deep thinking, thoughtful approach to this history is always required. And that's why it's important to talk about it and get it out there. She, he didn't go with her. She eventually made it to Philadelphia where she was bittersweet for her, she said, because she was free and yes, that was wonderful, but her family wasn't. So her intention was to go back. She worked as a cook for two years, saved up money and bought John a suit and was going back to get him as well. He came up um, when she got back to Maryland, found John, he had married another woman. Now, we're not mad at John because you never knew. And of course, her grief was like any other um, spouse's grief. It was horrible, but it didn't stop her. She brought 11 more people to freedom. But in 1851, she had to bring them to St. Catharines, where William Hamilton Merritt and Hiram Wilson um, were part of a freedom society and were there to help Blacks get settled. Now, the first group she brought wasn't really happy to have anything to do with white men. As I mentioned before, you're afraid of that white man because your experiences up till now had not been that comfortable. So the first winter was tough for that first group, but eventually Blacks became more and more comfortable accepting help from white men and, and Natives as well and getting settled into their new home called Canada. She did many things. She brought, she went back to the States when the Civil War came out. She was a nurse, a scout, a spy, and a cook. And her big accomplishment, sometimes I think it may have even been bigger than the um, bringing enslaved up because, oh, I forgot to tell you, Josiah Hansen also made trips back and forth to Maryland. He brought out 168 people. So many people brought other people. Once they found freedom, and this is another reason to be proud, I'm proud for sure of the culture and race I represent. We're free. We can get on with our lives. We can say, I'm sorry, my family isn't with me. You can pray for your family every day. No, they took action. They went back in putting themselves in peril and brought others to freedom. And Harriet did the same. But I always think sometimes because so many did that, that I, I just had the impression once when I was in Auburn that her contributions to the Civil War were even greater because she was in Sumter, South Carolina at Fort Buford, where she brought 700 formerly enslaved people to fight the Union Army. And they're putting up a statue in her honor. I'm not sure it might even be up now in her honor for having brought those enslaved, formerly enslaved people out. Because what would happen as the Union Army would approach these plantations, the plantation owners would would leave, just like um, you would leave livestock if there was something happening on property. So this is what they did. She eventually, Harriet Tubman, eventually went, chose her home to be in Auburn, New York. She got her mortgage from William Seward. William Seward was Secretary of State when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, but his family in Auburn also assisted freedom seekers to freedom. That's how she knew him. So she went and she got a mortgage from him. He didn't want to give her a mortgage, not because she was black or a woman, but because she never worked regularly. She was always very philanthropic in her endeavors. Um, suffrage movement, she spoke about that, bringing people to freedom. She was quite an activist. Even on her property after she built her home, she built a home for the aged. And, and when they came to her and said, Harriet, we really need to raise some money or charge these people. She said, no, because they wouldn't be here if they had somewhere else to go. You're going to have to find the money somewhere else. Amazing, amazing woman. Her death date is March 10th, was March 10th, 1913. And we don't know her exact exact birth date. So March 10th, we use as her birth date as well. It used to be 1820 that we celebrated her birth, but now there's documentation that pretty much conclusively by historians and academics 
um, it's strongly felt she was born in 1822. So that's why we're celebrating her this particular year, the 200th year after her birth. When I finished talking about Harriet Tubman, I always asked the question, because her faith was so strong, God talked to her all the time. Um, people believe that there was a professor out of Maryland who once said, because can you imagine what she would she could have done if she hadn't had narcolepsy? I take that up a bit with the now knowing that was temporal lobe epilepsy, where symptoms are strong faith in God, God talks to you all the time, would she have done all she did if she hadn't had that faith? I'm almost finished. I hope well, yeah, I was just gonna uh, chime in, Leslie, um, and just ask our viewers if anyone has any questions, you can put it into the Q and A uh, button right at the bottom of your screen. And um, when Leslie finishes up, we will um, take any questions that you do have, and she will gladly um, answer um, as many as she can. Okay, so, do we'll I have like another to... minute or two? Um, you can finish. I up. have one more site. I have one more yeah. site. We'll finish up on the last slide and then we'll get to those questions. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I'm glad to know I'm doing okay with the time because I don't have a clock in front of me at all. Um, the last site is back in Fort Erie. Once again, this is a more of a modern day. As you can see, the Niagara movement at the Niagara River, there was a, a place called Buffalo's $2 million playground built by um, some men from Buffalo, industrious from Buffalo. Back in the day when we didn't have to pay income tax, the government encouraged you to employ people and build things. I wish we could get back there again. But anyway, these men from Buffalo decided to build an amusement park. Many of them had properties on the Canadian side along Lake Erie and Fort Erie up through Crystal Beach and so on. And um, so they built this playground, it had amusement park, hotels, restaurants, and it was quite a pop. It was a going concern place where people came to enjoy the beach and just a resort area. It was sort of like Canada's Wonderland, but with the lake. And um, there was a man by the name of W.E.B. Du Bois, who was the first black, black man to obtain a PhD from Harvard. Um, for any academics in the audience, uh, getting a, presenting your dissertation just with content alone wouldn't be an easy task. But to try and present it um, with arguments just by your color alone would be incredible. And a lot of Blacks, particularly in the states where we have the historic Black universities and colleges, Education was paramount to them after they were freed. It was so important. They built their own schools and educated Blacks. Even prior to they, they in the North, um, they would have schools to educate Blacks because it was very important. So W.E.B. Du Bois was sort of a metaphoric speaker and writer. And he wrote a book called The Souls of Black Folks. And in it, he wrote, I don't want these freed people to just be Negroes. I want them to be Americans, meaning he wanted them to have all of the privileges that other Americans, enjoy, that white America enjoyed. So he gathered up a group of like-minded people. And in this particular group that he had, there were whites um, and blacks and women. And, but in this, at this particular meeting in 1905, um, 29 black men came to the meeting. They, and sadly, the internet will say they couldn't stay in Buffalo, so they had to come to Canada. Not the case at all. W.E.B. Du Bois wanted his people to be in a place he perceived as being more comfortable for them to discuss the Jim Crow, the segregation, the lynch lynchings, all of the segregation horrors that were happening in the U.S. and the things that were encumbering um, Blacks of that time to be able to move forward and truly be a part of the area. So anyway, they stayed one night at Mary Talbert's house. Mary Talbert was um, herself a member of this group. She was also part of the anti-lynching committee and another organization she was a part of was president of the National Negro Women's Council. Now in 1905, I find this amazing. Less than 50 years before that, black women had been used as concubine to produce enslaved children. Less than 50 years after the black women had been enslaved, they had a national organization going on. Just goes to show you what people can do in general um, when we put our mind to it. So um, I think that was remarkable, plus the fact she had to take care of 29 men in her house. Anyway, um, they came to Fort Erie the next day and they stayed at the picture there. That's the hotel that's believed they stayed in on property. And at the end of their two days, they came out with the doctrine or principles, which four years later led to the establishment of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People 
a formal civil rights organization. And as um, the late Frank Messiah, former president of the Buffalo chapter of the NAACP told me one day, he said, Leslie, this was an organization for civil rights, not just for blacks, but eventually leading to civil rights for everyone, the physically mentally challenged, the gay community, anyone who was seen as being outside of the norm. This was a civil rights organization for everyone. And as Canadians, we can be so proud that that organization, the concept of it started right where we are. Now I'm about to conclude my talk and um, I conclude with my uncle Kit. And my uncle Kit and my aunt Mark were the last two. This picture isn't very good, but it's the only one I have of the four of us. Whoops, it's not there. I must have taken it out, sorry. Um, it's a picture of my, um, my great uncle Kit, my aunt Mark, my mother and myself. That was it. And um, out of the 13 children, it was uncle Kit and aunt Mark that were left. And uncle Kit, um, aunt Mark and uncle Kit would debate who's gonna pass away first. Well, aunt Mark did. I went to see uncle Kit and um, who was in a nursing home at the time in the morning after she passed. And I said, uncle Kit, I have some bad news for you this morning. He said, you do, what is it? I said, well, and I talked like he did. He said, well, Aunt Mark passed last night. And he said, she did, poor thing, what happened to her? Now they're both in their 90s, so I wasn't sure what to say. So I just said, well, Uncle Kid, I guess she just gave up. He became so upset with the words I used. He said, what do you mean she gave up? You don't give up, you keep going till you can't go no more. And those words stayed with me until, and I remembered them when I started doing these tours. And I talk about a people who never gave up. They kept going until they couldn't go no more. From those two boys that went back and got their little sister, Josiah Henson, who could hardly move but carried his children to freedom. Harriet Tubman suffered severe headaches and had an epilepsy. Not only brought, did those trips back and forth to Maryland, but went on to fight in the Civil War. An amazing culture and race of people. That's why this history needs to be told. And I'm so happy to have been able to share it with you all today. Well, Leslie, uh, thank you so, so very much. And uh, I, I know when we first chatted uh, uh, before the Christmas break, we talked about the Harriet Tubman International Trail and of course the 200th anniversary of, of Harriet Tubman and uh, just so many significant things happening, not only this year, but but always when it comes to uh, connecting with and uh, you know Black Canadian heritage and our local history stories and how they intertwine the the Underground Railroad and its, and its incredible links through the Niagara region and beyond. Uh, I, I think it's absolutely a fascinating talk that you've given and uh, not only your personal explorations, but certainly that brings the stories home, but uh, but very much just the, the you know, I, I'm, I'm probably one of many. I, I go to Niagara and I wander around and I see some of these sites, but, you know, to hear the stories and really connect to them, uh, you know, just wonderful. And please, at some point, the book. <laughs> I hope, I hope. From uh, your mouth to God's ears. It'll happen if it's meant to be, but uh -huh. I'm so grateful. And I have more stories. I'm not done yet. There's tons more. Uh, and I look forward to it, and I encourage. I I plan on it when we're, when we're able to. I I, I want that in person tour. I can just imagine the the, the the ground you cover and the stories you cover. So you know the, the shameless plugs. Uh, uh, Niagara Bound Tours website www.niagaraboundtours.com and Thank on you. Facebook. Uh, yes, follow. like me on Facebook, please. And uh, tours on Facebook for sure. You, I forget about those things. <laughs> and you had you had uh, something uh, uh, a link on Facebook for something that happened yesterday, I believe. On, yes, uh, yeah. um, I, the Chamber of Commerce here is doing a thing called Home for Businesses, and, and this is where divine. My faith is just overboard. Things that have happened to me since I started doing these tours is just. I'm overwhelmed. I just uh, I've reached the point in my life now where I just go, it's God divine intervention i did a thing for the chamber i wasn't going to join the chamber because you know it's money you know it's the world today um, with this pandemic and i thought i'm not going to join but then just as i thought about it i get a call from the chamber saying hey do you want to be part of this home campaign that we have where we videotape you and i said sure well it just so happened i did the taping and it's on my facebook page it's on linkedin um you can see what i did and i talked about they took me around to sites and there's no me talking about the sites, but they show the sites. 
and then me talking about home and in it and i wish i could include it in this presentation but i'm not technical enough to do that it just is what home means to me it means where my ancestors lived and it means home to canada's rich black history and that's all i said and it worked out beautifully because it came out yesterday the first day of black history month which was perfect well that's Couldn't ask for better I was gonna say that's phenomenal and let's encourage everyone to go take yeah. a look at it and uh, also just you know in terms of uh, the, the theme of home I guess it, it, you know you you showcased parts of your home and and uh, uh, your connections to it and I think made us all a little bit more aware of kind of that rich layer the, 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 the rich and interconnected layers of history not only in Niagara but to the larger theme of uh, Black Canadian history and um, uh, the Underground Railway of course and, uh, and many of those stories and like you said probably just scratching the surface so uh, lots more to share. Oh there's so much more in all, all, all parts of Ontario and throughout the country and Please, British Columbia, we should be celebrating Elaine Collins, a black woman. And I love her because what she did when her family, black family, were in, in BC and the strange black people in the neighborhood, what she did was she invited them to learn and to know about instead of running around yelling racism. She knew that she chose to engage and inform and tell people eventually had her own television show in British Columbia. So get out there and buy those Elaine Collins stamps, another um, Black Canadian that we can be so proud of that many people probably don't even know who she is. She was a jazz singer as well. Or as a You know, maybe we could look forward to the day, and I don't know what it is, and I certainly don't mean to put you out of business by inviting stretch, but <laughs> we look forward to the day when when Black history is is and part of mainstream Canadian history, uh, and, and, and it is in, ingrained yes. in that, that, that fabric. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Uh, yeah. All of it. The Chinese history in Canada. That has we haven't touched on that yet either. There's so much Italian history, German history. Everybody. Well, like, said, it'll you, take time. You said you have German roots, so maybe we'll bring you. I'm back not going there, Matt. <laughs> or my Mohawk indigenous. History. There we go. Well, I had I, so many pieces and parts. I had to pick a lane. <laughs> well, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I, you know, I thank you so much for your willingness to share and be part of it, and yeah. uh, your enthusiasm for, for being part of our program, and uh, literally being our, our first one to kick off this series. So, just to uh, you know, just to, to everyone who's listened, thank you for joining us on our new webinar series, Black Heritage Matters, and thank you so much to uh, to Leslie Harper of Niagara Bound Tours for sharing her passion, her stories, her knowledge with us, and again, encourage every everyone to check out niagaraboundtours.com and uh, visit Leslie's uh, Leslie's uh, Facebook page as well. And uh, this program, again, through Heritage Mississauga, will be available on our YouTube and Heritage Bites podcast channel. So thank you, Leslie, thank so you. much. Happy Black History Month, everyone. Take care. And thank you, Matthew, for reaching out to me again, and Stephanie, Jamie, and Kelsey for the technical part and whatnot. Thank you so much. Go out there and learn some more about Black history. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us today for our new webinar series, Black Heritage Matters. We would like to thank Leslie Harper for sharing this exceptional presentation with Heritage Mississauga and for helping us to provide educational resources through the lens of individuals with personal lived experience and expertise. It is through understanding the truth of our history in its entirety that we can build connections, understanding, and allyship for our diverse communities in Mississauga. Heritage Mississauga would also like to thank the Community Foundation of Mississauga and the City of Mississauga for their financial support to help us to continue to bring educational programs and resources, such as this webinar series, to our followers. Join us next week on February 9, 2022, at 12 o'clock p.m., as we welcome Kathy Grant, who will be sharing her presentation of Black Canadian Veteran Stories. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our social media, YouTube, and podcast channels to stay up to date on all of Heritage Mississauga's programs and events.